So this is really uh, what New Testament theologians recognize as the primitive creedal statement of Christianity, that he, that he died, was buried, that he rose and appeared. And uh, if he conquered death, uh, that changes everything. Yeah. That's a great way of putting it, Christy. Thank you for joining us for Straight Thinking, a podcast from Reasons to Believe. Reasons to Believe, integrating science and faith. And now, here's your host, Joe Aguirre. Welcome to Straight Thinking, where we examine critical issues in light of the historic Christian worldview. This is Average Joe Aguirre with theologian and philosopher Kenneth Samples. We're giving Dave Rogstad this podcast off, and instead, Ken, we're continuing the discussion from the previous podcast on some questions to ask of the uh, scholar team here at RTB and, and the various apologists. And we're going to continue with a couple other people that, that some of our listeners already know, but you're going to introduce them formally here. That's right. There are a lot of very thoughtful people here at RTB, and uh, some of the voices you hear more than others. But I've invited uh, two of my friends, and my longtime friend, Krista Bontrager. She's part of the Scholar Team, does a lot of work with Reasons Institute, kind of keeping things in check, working with Jeff. Uh, let me begin with question one. Uh, outside of the Bible, what are the two most important books that shaped your Christian theological and apologetics perspective? Yeah, only two. Books only two. <laughs> mm, I've been thinking. As, I think both of the books actually were books I read probably in my first year of seminary, um, a little over 20 years ago. Uh, the first one was uh, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Wow. Very simple little book, um, but totally changed my world. I, when I read that book, after I read that book, I was never the same. I never looked at scripture the same again. And it, it gave me deep respect for the author and to try to change my goal when I interpret scripture from what does this mean to me to what does this mean? And it was just a completely different way of, of approaching scripture. So, uh, tell me his name again. Uh, Gordon Doug St- uh, Stewart and Gordon Fee is are the authors on that one. And then probably the other book was one that, Ken, you recommended to me fairly early in our uh, friendship was uh, Chosen by God by R.C. Sproul. Oh, wow. That one really opened my mind to Reformed theology and began my journey uh, to becoming Reformed. Mm. And um, again, just I was never the same after that. And reading that book, it just caused me to see the holiness of God in a profoundly different way and to see the sinfulness of man and the depths of my own depravity in a, in a new in a new way. So I think both of those books, yeah, I probably read those in about 19... 19- 92, 93-ish. So early so, part of your educational uh, time, yeah, seminary, early, seminary early, time. Yeah, graduate school, yeah. So. Sproul was such a good communicator. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe Joe, that's part of the uh, – Mortimer Adler talks about what is a great book. Maybe part of answering that is a, it, it's a book that you're never the same you know, reading. And uh, so Sproul is such a good communicator of those deep issues. Yeah. Chris, I have both those books that you mentioned, but I haven't read the first one. <laughs> now I got to, <laughs> I got to put that on my list. I've had it for a long time. It's just sitting, well, it's literally on my desk at home waiting to be read. I was very young intellectually in, in the faith when I, when I read it. And so it just, it made a huge impression on me. It was just I don't know if it would have the same impression on me now as a 42-year-old, but it just, as a young 22-year-old just starting seminary, it changed the whole trajectory of my life after I... Wow. And that's part of your intellectual ethos. I mean, you're always wondering, what does this verse mean? Not yeah. what does it mean to me? Yeah. What is it? What What did Paul mean? Yeah, got me a little bit out of my narcissism. Anything that gets me out of my narcissism, I'm, I'm good with that. Well, good. We'll touch on that a little later, yeah, Joe. Thanks for the recommendation. I'll read that one. Well, let's go to question number two here, Bob. Uh, Who is your favorite Christian thinker from the past and why? Again, I think I'm with Bob. It would have to be the recent past, and that is um, our friend uh, Ron Nash. Wow. I have um, almost all of his books. I have about 20 of his books, and I have some of his lecture series on my shelf there, and I look at him at night as I'm going to sleep and it's just he 
had such a profound influence on my thinking mm-hmm. and, and developing while I was in seminary. And it was probably one of the highlights of my life when you and I got to share the platform with him wow. one Wasn't year that a thrill? in 2003 and uh, at a Reasons to Believe com- conference. I remember getting our picture taken, the three of us, and I thought, <laughs> man, this is a little slice of heaven right here. This is <laughs> this is Krista's version of like me- meeting Michael Jordan or something. You know? The Nashites. Yeah, it was, it was just a, a great great moment to wow. meet that giant of the faith and he's gone on to to uh inherit his reward now but uh yeah. it, the legacy that he's left in the realm of I, I liked dr nash because he had a really good mix of philosophy and theology yeah and, and exactly a lot of christian philosophers they drowned in the philosophy yeah. and he always had this way of bringing it back yeah. around to the theology and, and the bible exposition and the practicality of it, of it all so yeah he he was my guy i just really enjoy him I, you know i said something very similar in the the earlier show that that one thing i really loved about dr nash is even though he was very sophisticated as an academic philosopher he was into the theology you always ended up back to essential Christian doctrine. He was a remarkable person. I I, I consider you and I blessed to have known him and met him. And, yeah, for, for And sure. I was very proud that he was so supportive of RTB. He was. I had the great privilege of sitting next to him at a dinner that we had at that conference yeah. and being able to share conversation with him. And he was very uh, friendly with us and just a very thoughtful guy. It was toward the end of his life, but it was just a yeah. wonderful moment that I savored every every second of it. So That's great. And you all have recommended at least one of his books that we at one time carried here at RTB. I don't know if we still do, The Word well, of God and the Mind of That's the my all-time favorite. That's why we carry it. Right. <laughs> we still carry it? Okay. It's part of the critical thinking course. Oh, yes. Okay. And um, mm-hmm. I just think of it as so foundational to just yeah. the understanding the concept of faith and and the, the relationship between faith and reason. Oh, he's and, so good at that. Yeah, his discussion of Augustine and Hume and Kant and just bringing all of these many threads together. I just feel like it's just 150 pages of brilliance. I, yeah. I love to reread that book uh, regularly. Wow. So. Super book. It's another one I need to I've only read excerpts. <laughs> Put it on your list, Chris, Joe. Yeah, thank you. Krista, you got any more? <laughs> Okay, well, let's move to question number three. Uh, which Christian apologist today do you hold in high regard and why? Um, well, I, first of all, I just would echo what, what Bob said. I, I've worked at Reasons to Believe now for 14 years. And wow, it's been that long? Yeah, it has. And uh, I can say unequivocally that Hugh Ross is an, one of the most interesting, complicated, brilliant, people that I've ever had the privilege of interacting with. And yet at the same time, his character is um, above reproach and mm. his simplicity of how he looks at the world and looks at life. He, he's pretty much just what you see is what you get. And um, he's, he's not a guy who rolls in a bends and bosses people around. He's a, he, I remember going to his house one year on Thanksgiving to take him a gift and he was out front uh, changing the oil in his car and sweeping his por- his porch, <laughs> and I'm I just said, Hugh, don't you have people that can do that for you? And and he just kind of laughed and and he's oh no, I enjoy it. And he's just he's a very simple person and very very straightforward individual. So I would definitely echo what what uh, Bob said. But I think for me, in terms of apologetics, besides Dr. Nash. Uh, and people are going to think that you put me up to this, Ken, but I would say you. I mean, oh, wow. really, you're you're the the man who's influenced me more in my life than uh, so many. I, I think probably more than anybody else. And just your care and concern for other people, both in your ministry and when you interact with them, that that people are not pawns. Mm-hmm. People are not just things to move around and into uh, for your own purposes. That people have their own issues and we need to not just dump arguments on top of their heads mm. they, they, we need to treat them with respect mm. and and with care and concern and i've learned that from you and watching your example for the 19 or so years that you and i have been friends and and i think the other thing that i've learned from you is how to respect other people's arguments mm. it's such a high compliment to me when people say you know i don't agree with you but i really respected the fact that you spoke about my position accurately. I learned that from watching you, and mm, you, you have mm. been—you have made a profound 
influence on on my life and in apologetics more than the technicalities of your argument but there was that too but just the way that you've lived in front of me and the way as I've watched you and and that has just been prof- just a privilege of my life again so well that's not only very kind and very surprising i i but i would say you know one of the things i think we all really enjoy about working here at reasons to believe is that we have developed these friendships and um you know, it, it's it's an exciting thing to work with people that you respect, and uh, uh, Hugh has been very kind to allow us to, uh, to have a place where we can work together and uh, grow so, together and grow together, and yeah. and to to face our challenges and our disappointments mm-hmm. and all of these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Well, we're we're making our way through these uh, ten questions. Uh, number four, did you have a critical mentor in your early developmental period of the faith? And if so, whom? I think for me, mentors have just been so foundational in my life. Um, growing up, uh, being raised by my mother in, in a single parent family and, and not having the influence of a father. I just maybe this is a good moment to say a word that. Um, if you're out there and, and you haven't had a father in your life or you've had a missing parent, and you hear people say, well, God will be that parent for you. I can tell you unequivocally that that's, that's been true for me. And wow. if you pray for that and ask for that, the Lord will send people into your life to help you at those moments and get you to the next stage. If you just open your heart and uh, and ask the Spirit to, to open your eyes to who those people might be. Um, when I was in college, there was an older man. And now I look back on it and I think, like, in this day and age— how this was this could have been a total setup for for me being taken advantage of but it was a godly man that god put in my life who taught me um how to do sound engineering mm. and he was the one that really taught me how to look at every job as a ministry and he 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 worked as an electrician at biola and he um was really the one who gave me my start in in my young life uh, when I was a college student, but he would take me out to dinner and he was probably in his fifties and he was wow. single. He'd never been married and I was 20 and it could have been, you know, you think about the situation now and you think mm-hmm. that's sort of weird, but he just had a hundred percent pure motives. He saw me as a lost soul and wanted to be kind of a father figure for me. Wow. And it kept me out of a lot of trouble, to be honest with you. He's the one that actually suggested I enroll at Talbot. He filled out my application for me, my reference form, and he saw potential in me that I didn't see in myself. Now, and, now some people don't know, but you and your husband, Bob, yeah. had a background in film at Biola. Yeah, we were both undergrads in the film program at Biola, and that was how we met. And um, then after that, I went to Talbot basically because um, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life and I really I was kind of lost and I thought well what do I do really well well I get straight A's pretty good maybe I'll go back to graduate school <laughs> wow <laughs> so I kind of wish my kids had that same <laughs> motivation but this guy Dave Russell at Biola he still works there and he just it was an amazing silent quiet shy man who was very humble and loved the lord and he just saw me and plucked me out of obscurity and and poured himself into me gave me jobs and helped me get a paying job on campus running sound and he taught me everything i know about production and ministry and so he was a huge mentor and then when i was in seminary walt russell Oh yeah. Who was my one of my professors at, at Talbot? He was the one that saw the potential in me to teach and to go into theology. And he approached me and he said, "You know, you should think about this as a career." And wow. I was like, "This is a career? <laughs> <laughs> what? Reading books?" <laughs> <laughs> and he he made me his TA for three years, and then he hired me on as a professor as a very young twenty seven year old. Took a chance on me. If it hadn't been for those two men being that father figure in those critical years of my life, I my life would have turned out profoundly differently. Mm-hmm. And wow. I would it, there's a lot of very difficult scenarios that seem extremely plausible if those two guys just hadn't come along and 
and poured themselves into me. So, yeah, this is, but they were a father to me that I know the Lord sent into my life to make a difference. You know, that uh, we, we talk about how our, our parents influence us, and it, it's sometimes difficult to know the tremendous extent, but, you know, God the Father loves us and cares for us, and uh, he brings those fatherly people, those father substitutes at yeah. times. And uh, I know... I know Dr. Russell. He is uh, kind and and a good scholar. Extremely um, good scholar. Yeah. Number f- question number five, Bob, is what do you consider as your life's verse from Scripture and why? Yeah, I, I'm sitting here thinking I only get one. Uh, <laughs> probably, and people are going to think this is sort of an obscure thing, but um, probably some passages like Luke chapter 1. Um, this, uh, many have undertaken to draw up an account for the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those from, from the first eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. It wow. seemed good also to me write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know, and this is my favorite part, the certainty <laughs> wow. of the things you have been taught. And there, I can get my preach on, but it was <laughs> that for me, when you read that verse to me in 1993, Ken, it changed my life mm. because no one had ever told me before that there was any such thing as an orderly account that things were carefully investigated or as Mm. Peter says um, that these were not cleverly invented tales um, but they were from the eyewitnesses the concept of our faith being historical and eyewitness based changed my life I went from a passive uh, apathetic Christian to this if if these things really happen, this changes everything, mm. and it changed my life. And that's been the message of my adult life is to preach that that message to everyone who will listen that uh, these things have been carefully investigated, yeah. and that we may know the certainty of, of these things. And my handle online for email and whatnot is always Theophilus. Okay. That I am the most I excellent. I am yeah. the most excellent mm. Theophilus, the lover of God, the the lover of truth. So, so here's Luke, who is uh, what we know about him is he was a physician, uh, uh, a, a, a careful investigator, being a, a doctor, associate of Paul, and. Uh, the reason he ends up being an author of one of the Gospels is because he has access to all the key people, Paul, probably Peter, and others. What what a great passage yeah, that is. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's, uh, that's a terrific passage. Uh, question number six, what argument or fact or piece of evidence do you view as being the most probative in support of the truth of Christian theism? Krista, how about you? What... Can you narrow it down to an argument oh, or a for piece sure. of evidence? Yeah, I think a uh, great story about that. A few years ago, I was riding with my dad on an airplane. We were going to Boise together for a little vacation. And he asked me on the airplane, uh, why are you a Christian? Mm-hmm. And I said, oh, that's easy. And I think he was expecting me to tell him a little story about my testimony or whatever. And I said, it's because Jesus rose from the dead. Mm-hmm. And if Jesus rose from the dead, then that changes everything. Mm-hmm. And he was so shocked by that answer. He had never heard a Christian give that sort of like a proof and evidence as an answer for why they were a Christian. And so for me, when I teach, one of my favorite things to teach on is 1 Corinthians 15, that if, you know, Christ has not been raised, we are still in our sins. In the intimate tie that history and and theology have to each other and um, that if Christ as a historical event has not been raised, then we are still in our sins. And that is just a profound truth, a transformational truth. So so this is really uh, what New Testament theologians recognize as the primitive creedal statement of Christianity, that, yeah. he, that he died, was buried, that he rose and appeared. And uh, if he conquered death, uh, that changes everything. Yeah. That's a great way of putting it, Krista. Great. Okay, uh, how about this question? It's number seven. What is the greatest challenge to your faith as a Christian? The thing that makes me lay awake at night is uh, the fate of the unborn and children. Mm. 
if there was one question that I wished Scripture would more robustly speak about, it's the fate of the unborn or very young children that, that die. I wish I knew what happened to them. I wish the Lord was more clear on that. But for whatever reason, he's just chosen to reveal only a very limited amount of information. But it's it that, that does trouble me. And okay. um, it's hard for me to provide counsel for friends, girlfriends who have lost children and mm. had miscarriages and experience the death of a child the motherly and, side yeah and... the motherly side of me when they come to me as a theologian and want answers about that telling them that well really this is a question the bible doesn't explicitly address it feels really lame yeah. and from from a pastoral perspective so you know in the earlier show i was sharing that uh, like Joe, the the problem of evil disturbs me, but it's it's not so much having an answer as it is trying to comfort people. What do I say to people who are going through, yeah. you know, the Newtown shooting? What would I say to the who've lost? Uh, I can't imagine losing my first grade daughter or son. You know, so okay, good stuff. Uh, we're moving toward the end stretch here. We're on question number eight. Uh, now I'm gonna delve into your psyche here a little bit. Uh, <laughs> actually, I'm going to ask you as an apologist. I'm, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but mm-hmm. as an apologist, what is the greatest sin that you wrestle with? Probably my greatest challenge and, and just being a little bit on the personal side is I really struggle with this the sin of, of pride. Mm-hmm. And pride is in, I call it a spiritual cancer. It is a an insidious thing that when it gets into your soul, especially when you work in ministry, mm-hmm. I see it so much in, in people that work in the ministry field and doing kingdom work that when you have success in ministry, pride can be something that can come in and really pollute the the, the situation in your relationships with your fellow co-workers in Christ. And um, it's something that I've had to uh, learn how to be very vigilant about mm. looking for in my life. And Do you think so, that's especially true in apologetic work? I think it is because there's a sense of which, hey, I have all these answers. Let me tell you these answers. You're going to yeah. love these answers. And uh, it, it's very easy to fall into a posture of, of I know more than you. I'm even possibly better than you because I know more than you. And I think that pride in, in ministry can become an idol, where ministry becomes the idol. And so when you have success in ministry, um, sometimes I'm a little bit thankful that I haven't had more success in ministry. Mm-hmm. Because I think if I had, I think the Lord's been gracious to me to limit you know, what I'm doing because my pride is is a stumbling block for me and so i i, I don't know i think for me that's just it always comes back to to that so. you know you mentioned the the n word narcissism oh I yes mean, uh, i am a nar- i'm a recovering narcissist <laughs> it, it, it's just so easy to think it's all about you you know it's yeah, all about me, me? <laughs> and uh wow <laughs> question number 9 here if you had to do it all over again what would you do differently in preparing to be a christian apologist Boy, if I had to do over again, I think like Bob, I'm just so grateful to see how God's hand has been in my life and guiding me providentially, helping me choose a really sound seminary and going to Talbot, having outstanding professors that not only were academically outstanding, but just outstanding Christians and and um, meeting you and then coming to work here at Reasons to Believe. I mean, all of these steps that were both intentional on my part, but then things that just happened to me and, and the Lord brought into my life. It's, it, I really wouldn't change anything. I think earlier in my life, I probably would have answered this question. Well, what I should have done was not had children and gotten a PhD. Mm. Um, but God, again, God had another plan and he knew I needed those children in order to grow up in my faith more. And then if I had not had children, I would have stayed in my little ivory tower of I know everything and I don't need to reach out to other people. But children 
um, having children doesn't look great on my resume, but it has profoundly changed me as as a person, and it has caused me to learn how to trust God more. So now you have a website, yeah. Theology Mom, which That's right, I think Theology is, Mom. is a very interesting and engaging uh, title. But you're. Uh, you know, when we look at our resumes and when we think academically, that life is much bigger and broader. And uh, I remember when uh, my wife and I brought our first child home, my life changed totally. I I, was, I remember thinking and saying to Joan, are we ever going to be the same? And the answer is no. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my academic dreams kind of went up in the cloud of smoke, but it – God knew what he was doing, and wow. it's it's all turned out okay. So, Very good. We have now arrived at the 10th question. Uh, um, what important apologetic lesson has working at RTB taught you? I think for me, uh, when Hugh and I used to do the old radio show. Creation long, update? Yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, we when I first started in the role as the host, I was – still fairly new at the ministry at the time and I had maybe worked here a couple of years but I was still learning about Hugh's value system and um, I think that when I first started Hugh made me care about scientists Hmm. even even after eight years in seminary I can't say that I had a, a deep appreciation for general revelation the way that Hugh did. And he made me care about that. He made me care about skeptics, atheists, and scientists. He made me see them as he saw them, that they were an unreached people group that the church had left behind Mm. and left out. And that that was our mission. You know, I didn't get on an airplane and go to Africa I drove to Reasons to Believe so that I could help facilitate the communication and bring the gospel and the Great Commission to this particular group of people. The book of nature. Yeah, and it it made me care about them. And I remember sitting in this studio one day with the guys, with Hugh and Fuzz, and Fuzz said something. It it changed me. He said, "Um, Jesus loves scientists too. And I thought, how profound and how simple. (laughs) And yet I realized in that moment I hadn't believed that up until then. And I hadn't believed it in a, in, in a deliberate awareness of, of, like, you're right. Jesus does love scientists. They aren't a cultural enemy to be conquered. They aren't somebody to be confronted and, and we need to go after them. They're the evil evolutionists. They are people that Jesus loves mm. and that he has given his life for and and it we are bringing them the gospel hugh and fuzz and my friendships with them made me care about all of that and it wasn't just a a theological construct of you know hey let's make sure we've got all our theology exactly you, you know with pinpoint accuracy it was okay we've got the theology down now how are we evangelizing these people how are we bringing them the gospel how are we speaking their language when the day that light bulb went on in my head, I'm like, ah, oh, I get it now. So, yeah, it changed me. You know, I know that this is something all three of you can relate to. Um, I was telling Bob this morning that I've met so many of these uh, Christian apologists who belong to the, the, the RTB community, and many of them have advanced degrees in, you know, physics and engineering or medicine, and I was telling Bob that they will often come to me and uh, they'll ask me, well, Ken, you know, what do you think of this? And I, I, I'm so, I so admire them for their background and their accomplishments and how deeply humble and caring and devoted they are. I feel like saying, well, I don't know. What do you think? You know, <laughs> uh, and, and I think that's probably a deep compliment to Hugh Ross that he uh, – he has attracted a, a, a tremendous group of men and women who love the Lord and yet love the book of nature and the book of Scripture, uh, that two books idea. Well, thank you, the three of you. Uh, I'm really impressed with uh, 
you gave better answers than the questions. The answers were better than the questions. So, Joe, I'm going to turn it back to you to uh, to, to finish right. us off here. Uh, Ken, I might ask you if there are any book recommendations. We've gone on for two podcasts now wow. about some of the things that people can, can learn as they a look at themselves in their apologetics journey. Krista, maybe you have a book recommendation as well for people who are kind of developing in their own apologetics. Well, you, you know, I, I think it's uh, I think it's very important to kind of get the, uh, the the backstage. Sometimes I I remember reading a book years ago called Philosophers Who Believe. And they talked about their lives and they talked about their inadequacies and and kind of answering the questions that, that we've been looking at. Uh, there are also books out there, scientists who believe. Uh, Hugh has participated in some of this. Uh, Mark Clark, I think, was also involved. Sc- Christian scholars who believe and they talk about the – the, the things that meant so much to them. So there are some good books out there that talk about Christian biography. And, and, and again, it, it, it's not just knowing things. It's who you are and your relationship with, with the Lord. Anything come to mind, Krista? Well, I guess actually what's coming to mind is I can think of a couple of books I wish someone would write oh, wow. about this. I think we need to send this podcast to Baker, try to sell him on Hugh's <laughs> idea for a book on evangelism. Oh, wow. Because all of us are extolling his virtues on how unique he is in this area. But um, I would love to see a book just on um, kind of the relational side of apologetics, you know, mm. that that because that's what all of us I'm hearing at the table have learned from working here is it's not just the arguments. Apologetics isn't about just a bunch of arguments. It's yeah. about the relationships that we build with people and that evangelizing scientists is a unique process um, and if you want to do that, you know, it, it, it's going to take some time. But, yeah, I can't really think of anything off the top of my head, Joe, to recommend to people. It's just, you know, getting into apologetics, there's a lot of due diligence you have to do on the front end to get some basics of the arguments. Like Moreland's Scaling the Secular City is a great introduction or Bill Craig's book on apologetics is another great introduction. you got to kind of at the front end do some hard work and then you can branch off into the areas of your personal interest but it's once you get in there there's just a lot of great things that can happen so yeah excellent i'll throw in ken's book without a doubt absolutely uh, for for people yeah i know that's been very helpful for a lot of folks okay that's going to wrap it up for this podcast part two of a two-part look into the rtb Uh, apologists here and how they have come to adopt the positions they do. Let us know what you think uh, and tell us about your own journey. Uh, Send an email to ask at reasons.org and we will make sure and consider that. Uh, This is Joe Aguirre with a reminder that the historic Christian faith involves knowledge and is compatible with reason. Thanks for listening and join us for the next edition of Straight Thinking. podcast is made possible through the generous gifts of the Friends of Reasons to Believe. For more information on how you can support this podcast, visit our website at reasons.org slash donate.